It's 4 o'clock on a Tuesday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting Quarantini Happy Hour. Yeah. I got the applause cue right on time. Hello, everybody. How are you guys? Long time no see. Feels like it was just yesterday. Let's get that chat room open. And there they are. The usuals or unusuals, as the case may be. Uh, let's see who we've got here. We've got Amanda West, Akira Canyon, Giovanni Lanza, uh, John Pearson, Jesse J. Peck. A lot of chit-chat amongst those three. Martin Gravel, Ewart Williams. Whoa, there it is, jumping like crazy. Dean Turner, Dan Weber, Debbie Ward, Brad Gray, Andre Stepanian, Peter Rahill, Cass McKenty, Jim Stamper, Terrell Beckless, Il Rosso Emil. Hello, everybody. How are you guys? Good to see you again. Um, I've got a few uh, comments that were left on yesterday's video, and I will address those momentarily. I'm waiting to see if some of these folks show up. Um, Glenn Letts is one of them, Andre's here, um, Brandon Vaughn, uh, hopefully will show up so he can hear my answer. Uh, let's see who else has joined us since I last looked at the chat. Songs from a headband, hello. Um, Darren Fletcher, Charles Robichaux, is it Robichaux? Um, Scott Hansen. <laughs> you didn't say anything too disturbing. Uh, it's a matter of opinion. <laughs> uh, hello, Karen Brasher, Heidi Owen, Mike S. All right. So, yeah, I was shocked yesterday that I actually got that show done. At first, I thought it was going to be kind of short. Um, and then as I was going down my list of stuff to talk about, I thought, wow, I can make this a 90-minute show. And it ended up being a minute over. So I was happy about that. Mark Real, hello. You're welcome for yesterday's college course. Um, your wife, Scott Hanson's wife, has a bar of soap ready to go. Um uh, I'm not, I'm not going to touch that. I'm going to totally leave that alone. Sounds like there might be a prison joke in there somewhere. Um, Peter Barcott still technically working the day job. So am I. So we've got something in common. Um, oh, you're welcome, guys. Yeah, I, had a, I put some work into getting that show prepped in... Uh, I don't like working from paper. I feel like I, I don't read well like a newscaster. I'm better at doing it on the fly. Uh, but as the show went on, I got a little looser and was able to go back and forth between the paper, the camera, the paper, the camera. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely a primer for new members. You know, it's so frustrating for all of us on the staff when... Uh, people get bummed out you know three months into their first year's membership and they just dry up and go away and i know that we could save them in quotes uh, i know i sound like some sort of evangelist but uh, you know if they would just partake in this kind of stuff um they would go oh i get it and it literally has been so obvious to us for a long time now that the members who partake in the forum and the road rally and the taxi tvs those are the people that hang in and those are the people that sign deals and get placements. And we want that for everybody, obviously. Um, guess what, Akira? I actually own a teleprompter. I found a teleprompter that's good for uh, webcasting and it wasn't that much money. It was like under 200 bucks and it works with an iPad or a phone. Um, I set it up one, try, one time and tried to use it and just felt clunky. But I do know that there's definitely a learning curve with learning to read from a teleprompter. Um, I, I love watching TV to see who is actually reading from teleprompters, looking at their 
irises in their eyes, see if they're their pupils, see if they're going back and forth. That's right, no fake news here. Um, yesterday's show was well-designed and succinctly informative. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, <laughs> Somebody named Deborah called in the middle and my wife is calling you. <laughs> Hopefully she was in her capacity as uh, member services. <laughs> My teleprompter, the car. <laughs> um, to Paul Gavin Music, uh, very grateful for the show yesterday. Sorry, we've got an itchy eyeball there. Um, uh, I took notes, doing Middle Eastern percussion listings. Any suggestions for keeping percussion only instrumental cue for three minutes without too much repetition? Uh, I can tell you for certain that simpler is always better. Um, repetition is fine. Um, if it's not repetitive, it needs to be repetitive with that growth I talked about, you know, the forward momentum. So just don't try to be fancy and introduce a lot of, wow, that was a really cool idea because if people are thinking that, they're not thinking about the dialogue. So um, honestly, best thing you could do would be put it together, throw it up in peer-to-peer -peer on the forums and ask other experienced members what they think before you submit it. That's always a good idea, actually. Jim Stamper says, Deborah is awesome. Well, thank you. Amanda West, Deborah never calls me. That's because she would need a satellite phone. <laughs> actually, she could probably call you on WhatsApp, um, but then you would know her number. You know what we'd have to do to you. <laughs> um, hello, Jan Wylage, the lady from Snookland. Peter Rail, still waiting and looking forward to your RSW guitar build episode. Oh, okay, that's not to me. Any word on when you'll be able to get back to taxi headquarters? That's a great question, Dan. You know, every time we feel like we're going to be able to go back, first of all, just about everybody in our office complex, it's three buildings that are probably like 30,000 square feet each. Um, most of the people are back. Uh, we typically have two, three, or four people under the roof all taking care of member services stuff. You, doing the remote phone thing was really hard. Getting calls to come into our phone system at the office, then forward out to um, staff members who were working at home was just glitchy, just really, really hard to deal with. Liz was handling the vast majority of those calls, and uh, we bought her like a burner phone, or we had a burner phone already and the sound quality was just terrible. So at some point where pretty much everybody else was kind of coming back to the office complex, we put uh, Liz and Randy in the office. Randy is a new member services lady who's been there now for three or four months. Uh, and, and you can't really learn member services at Taxi remotely because you're constantly, there's so many details, so much to know. It's not like you know doing customer service elsewhere um you got to know a lot of stuff if somebody calls says what's the difference between you know a non-exclusive and an exclusive deal um how long should i wait before i give up on a thing that was forwarded just all those things are very particular to taxi and our members you really need a second person within earshot of you uh under normal circumstances we would have like the first two weeks of somebody's training would take place at the front desk with the last with the outgoing person from that position sitting right next to them or in the couch a few feet away so that the new person could put the uh the member on hold say you know i'm brand new let me ask somebody put them on hold 
ask the question, get the answer, go back on the phone and, and handle it. So we actually moved Liz from a very distant office to a relatively close office. So she was within earshot of Randy. So Randy could ask her those questions. Um, Matt is also back in the office and he's like, I don't know, 70 or 80 feet away. So we're not too worried about them uh, infecting each other. Um, we've been very fortunate and very careful about that. And uh, about, I don't know, three weeks ago or so, the office said, okay, we're unlocking the door. You, you could go there, but you had to have a key to get in the front door. So technically it was still locked down. Um, but if, if the work was deemed essential, which in the case of, of Liz training Randy, that was pretty essential. It's not like we were saving lives or, uh, you know, doing uh, secret government work or something, but uh, it was essential that they had to be in the same physical space. So then uh, we had the three of them under the roof and we were starting to look at, well, you know, pretty much everybody in the complex is back to work. And now our governor is putting all kinds of restrictions back out there. And I wouldn't be surprised if the office building starts locking the front doors again. Who the hell knows? Um, Yep, can't beat face-to-face -face in business. JP, you and your family had, uh, had the COVID? Is that what I'm reading in there? Scott Hansen, I'm in Ohio. We don't put turkey in our pot pie. We put pot in it. <laughs> oh, man. Wow, uh, so you only had a headache and a little bit of chest tightness. Lasted a day, wow. You still have it, JP, wow. Well, I hope you get over it quickly. I'm glad that you've, uh... wow. I'm glad, you know, not glad that you got it, but glad that it, it's not been that hard. Um... Liz says, doors are still open at the building, but not all people wear masks. Shame on them, huh? Um, Scott Hansen longs for the day he gets to be on the show. I'm, I am not joking when I tell you someday I am going to show up and we're doing a show from inside the restaurant. Yeah, I've heard very few uh, cases of people that have had it and had it really bad. I've heard a few, um, but most of the people, I think all the people that I know personally, um, not, well, you know, my friend told me that his sister-in-law had it kind of stuff, but people that I know firsthand that have had it have all reported, uh, basically, it was like a, a bad cold or a mild flu. So thank goodness for that. Wow, man, and those three people who've died. That's sad. I'm sorry to hear that. All right, here's a music question about how long should the sections in an instrumental cue be? If a client asks for an instrumental cue that's three minutes long, how long would you suggest for the length of those sections? Um, it really depends on the genre of music and the tempo. Um, obviously, if it were something kind of slow and a legato feeling cue, the sections would probably end up being longer. It would feel unnatural to have them change quickly. Um, I, I don't really have an exact prescription other than Listen to other cues. Go on the forum and listen in the forward section or the Taxi Forwards blog and check out other members' um, submissions that got forwarded 
and see, excuse me, see if you can find stuff that's in a similar genre and tempo and let that be your guide. Oh, Paul says it's the Middle Eastern percussion thing again that he's talking about. So it's so hard to say with something like that. Um, Darren Moss, sorry you're late. <laughs> Do you have a hall pass, Darren? <laughs> um, hello, Anthony. Welcome back. Uh, is there a max number for songs hosted on one's profile? There used to be a cap, and I believe when we redid the back end about a year ago that we got rid of the cap. So, I mean, you know, within reason, it's unlimited. Um, please don't put 2,000 songs up there because we do pay for storage, but it's gotten cheaper over the years, obviously. And so we just figured we would take the cap away. Um, for all I know, the programmer put a cap in, you know, like, uh, and they don't do it by 100 songs or 200 songs. They do it by uh, amount of data stored. But I'm sure he must have put some sort of cap in there to stop people from being ridiculous, but you would probably never reach it if you're not insane. <laughs> Yeah, one of my daughters um, lives in Jerusalem, and she's kind of like an RA uh, at a school um, for 18 and 19 year old girls, and um, they live literally in the, right in the heart of the old city in these ancient old stone buildings that have been turned into apartments. Um, not exactly the fanciest lifestyle, but that's what she wanted. And uh, I think that there are 120 girls at the school and oftentimes they have like six girls in a bedroom and bunk beds and, you know, fairly large bedrooms, not spacious, but, you know, large enough to ho hold six young ladies. And so they had an outbreak uh, a couple of months ago and a bunch of them got it. And she said, basically every, of course, they're all young. They're 18, 19 years old. And she said, uh, none of them had to go to the hospital. Um, several of them tested positive and barely had any symptoms at all, other than maybe feeling a little tired and headachy. Others had, you know, colds, uh, runny noses, and some congestion and stuff, but nothing bad. So thank goodness for that. Universal Audio is now offering API summing. Why is API summing good? Um, probably because it emulates the sounds of the old summing, uh, you know, the old API consoles, which were great sounding consoles. Um, and they had, uh, I think they're called summing amplifiers in there. Uh, back in the day when they were originally um, discrete consoles, they probably did it all with transistors before they went to like chips and stuff. So, that's my guess. Um, Dean Turner, love Jerusalem. Pretty ancient. It's hard to imagine, you know. But the country, Israel's magical. You, you get off the plane there once you're out of the airport. Um, just everywhere you look, they're like uh, these incredibly modern office buildings and ruins not far away. And there are plenty of places where you can just like get out of your car on a country road and jump a fence and walk over to some 4,000 year old, you know, remnant of a stone house out in the middle of a field. It's, it's a trip. Um, Darren Fletcher, my older submission history has disappeared. Can I still retrieve it? Uh, I honestly don't know the answer to that, but somebody on my staff will know because they know more of that stuff than I do. Um, let's see.
runny noses and congestion in sinus is not COVID. I don't know where they had the, it could have been chest congestion. I don't know. I ain't no doctor. Charles asks, um, would you consider an episode on the business side of the business of music, especially where you become successful? Uh, things you might need to think about needing outside of the legal. Um, I'm not sure what you mean because there's so many aspects. Are you talking about somebody who does music for sync? Or are you talking about I'm a rock star and just got signed to a record label? Uh, a lot of that stuff we actually have discussed over the years in shows. Um, Yeah, Dispatch was originally created for short turnaround stuff. Um, I'll tell the Dispatch story one more time. Um, I don't mean that to sound snotty, but I've, re I've told this a lot. Um, in 2000 or 2001, when we moved, uh, when we were leaving, we had two three-bedroom apartments in Woodland Hills. That was the taxi headquarters. We eventually moved to um, the office space that we're in now, somewhere around 20 years ago. Uh, around that time, all of a sudden, we started getting more and more listings were just coming in. We weren't even going after them. They were coming in um, for film and TV, and they were often much shorter timelines than we were used to dealing with. For the first, I don't know, um, you know, 10 years or so a Taxi, the vast majority of the listings were for record companies, either looking for songs they had uh, for artists on their roster or they were looking for new acts. So we would typically run listings for 30, 60, and 90 days. Excuse me. Uh, and we only published the listings on the 1st and 15th of every month. Um, Ah, oh, the ice cream truck is nearby. I hear the music. And then all of a sudden we started getting a lot more requests from music libraries. We would get requests from music supervisors and they needed stuff in four days or a week. Timelines that were way shorter than what we were used to dealing with. The record labels didn't care, generally speaking. Sometimes country labels did because they would go into the studio 10 days from now and just cut one song or two songs. But most of the time when a, a label is looking for stuff for, you know, back then it would have been like Whitney Houston, let's say, or Mariah Carey, whomever. Um, they know, you know, months and months in advance that they're going back into the studio to start a new record and they start poking around looking for new songs. So they had a long fuse on their timeline and the same thing was true of labels looking for acts. They weren't like, you know, hey, I'm looking for a pop punk band like Blink-182 and I need it in a week. They're like, yeah, if you can find me something like that, let me know. So we would run the listings for 30, 60, or 90 days. So when we started getting in these quick turnaround things, we had to mobilize in a completely different way. We had to wrestle up the right screeners more quickly. Um, we didn't have an online submission process, so we had to dedicate somebody who only uh, opened and logged opened packages that were CDs for the most part, um, and logging the information into the database by hand. Uh, and then we had a point person who was in charge of doing the intake on all those listings and making sure that the music was screened, doing basically the job of, of what Angela, our head screener, does now, but only for dispatch, and then packaging all the stuff up physically, literally making you know compilation CDs out of the forwards, and sending that stuff out. So basically we had a company operating within a company. Um, and as it grew to the point where we were getting quite a few of those listings, we said, why don't we just start a thing called Taxi Dispatch? And we did a focus group with, I don't know, 10 or 12 members. Uh, they all liked the idea. We hashed out how we would execute it. They were fine with it. Um, they actually offered up some good suggestions. So we rolled it out. And we figured not everybody would be into it because it was film and TV and the majority of our members were into pitching songs or pitching themselves as an artist or a band. So we named it Dispatch. We charged, I think it works out to like 149 bucks a year to upgrade to it. 
everything was faster turnaround. Well, as time went on, a lot of stuff became film and TV, and we just had to learn with those shorter uh, deadlines, you know, how to do it on a grander scale, if you will. And then something notable happened, which was we started noticing that the people submitting to Dispatch were kind of ignoring the listings, the fast turnaround listings for songs, but they were all over the instrumental listings. So we made a point um, to, because they started to complain, we're not seeing enough instrumental listings, they really wanted to submit to libraries. Uh, so Dispatch just kind of morphed into this thing that was mostly library stuff, mostly instrumental stuff, and it just is what it is. Um, and, and the timeline thing really isn't so much of an issue now. Um, and, and we talked about getting rid of it, I think, two or three years ago, and people were like, no, don't get rid of it. But I think the solution is going to be that we will roll dispatch into regular taxi. Um, and I, I've told you guys before, we're going to raise the price of taxi. I just don't want to do it while people are still out of work. But once people start getting back to work and things kind of normalize, we're going to have to raise the price. I mean, our, our profitability has just been, you know, every year more and more and more of the profit gets shaved off because all the expenses have gone up wildly over 29 years. So we're going to roll dispatch into taxi and raise the price of taxi. So basically you'll be getting dispatch, but the price increase of taxi will not be equal to the price of getting dispatch and taxi. So there you go. You'll get more, you'll pay a little more, but you won't pay as much as you would have if you were buying a taxi membership and an upgrade to dispatch. So there you go. Um, Yeah, so the difference now is Dispatch is almost entirely uh, um, instrumental stuff. Um, sometimes we'll get somebody that needs a song for something fairly quickly and we'll put that in there. And, and once again, we just don't get big numbers of submissions. The sad part is when we run a listing, uh, like a listing for a song in Dispatch, um, and we don't get many submissions, that means we don't find much good stuff to forward. And then the client is disappointed. It's like, hey, I thought you guys could find me something cool. Well, okay, we found you two, um, whereas normally, you know, it might be 10 or 15 or 20, you know, some substantial, you know, bucket of stuff that they can find, not just one thing that they like, but several generally. Um, yeah, Darren, I agree. It's been too long. I mean, what company doesn't raise their price in 29 years. I, I I can't remember if I did this on Taxi TV or if I did it elsewhere, but I actually sat down and, and did some research and found, you know, like the, the cost of a house in 1992 um, compared to what the average price of a house is now, uh, the price of a car, and I could be misquoting this, but I think I'm in the ballpark, that the price of a car, the average price of a car in the United States in 1992 I want to say it was like seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars, and now it's like thirty-eight thousand um, dollars. But taxi has been the same three hundred dollars a year. Plus, we're always running the discount things. People, you know, respond well to discounts. So people that have been on the email list, they've been thinking about, it, they've been thinking about it. Then they see that they can save a hundred bucks. They go, "Oh, I'm going to join." So there you go. Scott has you getting a quarter pounder and fries and a Coke for the price of a quarter pounder. There you go. It's like a McDonald's family deal or whatever they call them. What made you know taxi was going to be six, uh, going to work and be successful? Did you have a dream of a new future endeavor and you made it happen? Um, 
I didn't know it was going to be successful other than to say if it failed, my family would have suffered. I put it all on the line as most entrepreneurs do. You know, it, it's hard to start something as a side gig and turn it into a real company and make it successful. So, you know, my last real job before taxi was uh, like, I want to say I made 109,000 bucks a year. Um, and by the way, it took me, I think, seven years to get back to the $100,000 mark. And the first two years, the end, I thought, you know, I had the greatest idea in the world and that musicians all over the world would just go, oh, this is awesome. Finally, you know, I can get access to the industry based on the quality of, of what I'm submitting. I was wrong. The industry warmed up to the idea rather quickly, frankly. I mean, the first listing I ever got um, was from Craig Kalman, who's now like, I don't know, co-chairman of Atlantic Records. Um, anyway, the industry warmed up to it pretty quickly. It was the musicians who didn't because of that old adage, don't pay anybody to listen to your music. Well, really what that adage started out as was don't pay anybody to publish your music because there would people be people out there back in the day that would charge musicians to publish their music. So uh, musicians were skeptical and I'm still working hard. Here I am 29 years later, still trying to prove to people that we're real, that the listings are real, that the screeners are who we say they are. Um, you know, there's still a ton of skeptics out there. So uh, it was slim pickings. First couple of years, Deb and I lived on, uh, we would buy sausages. Um, they were more like hot dogs, a little less like sausages, <laughs> kind of like, I'm trying to think, uh, yeah, but they came in a package like a hot dog. We would literally take one of them and slice it paper thin, throw it into a skillet on high heat and char those little suckers till they got really brown, almost crispy like potato chips. And then dump a can of like stewed tomatoes that we could buy for about 57 cents at the time, dump that over it and then put it over a bowl of penne pasta. And that was dinner like three or four nights a week. Um, we're definitely living a ramen lifestyle. Had a mattress on the floor, um, bought a used car with about 90,000 miles on it. Uh, it was a tough couple of years, but the reason it succeeded was just good old hard work, you know? I couldn't fail. First of all, I didn't want to fail in front of my children. I didn't want my kids to see daddy fail, number one. And uh, one of my daughters who's now, gosh, she's gonna be 40 in March, at the time, she was like 11 years old, I think, and she said to me uh, something on the order of, you've taught me a great life lesson. And I said, what's that, Rach? And she said that you can do anything you want to do if you're willing to work hard enough at it. And I said, wow, that was worth the price of all the pain and suffering that it took to get this company off the ground. So, And, and she's turned out to be a great kid with a great work ethic. So there you go. Um, my biggest lesson with Taxi so far, wow, that would require a 90-minute show. My biggest lesson, um, there are so many. Uh, the biggest lesson is hard work pays off. You know what? There, there is no plan B. I literally did not have a plan B by intent. Because if I had a plan B, then I wouldn't have been giving plan A every ounce of energy that it required. Um, that's right, Akira. I had to finish my seven-year plan so we could have a five-year plan. Andre, what's wrong with that dinner? I ate it all the time. It wasn't. A, it was actually really good. We still make it. Uh, we had it as recently as probably ten days ago. Except now we use two sausages. <laughs> um, but the point was, it was dirt cheap. You know, the whole dinner was like under two dollars for two people. Um, we definitely learned how to live a very frugal lifestyle. And once you learn that, uh, it's very empowering because you know that if you have to go back to that, you can. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Uh, Anthony says, glad it worked out. Taxi fan for life. Thank you.
combination of imposter syndrome and Dunning-Kruger, I know Diane Kruger, she's cute, uh, makes it hard for musicians to pay to get hard. Well done on getting at least some, I suppose. I did have the Stephen Pressfield attitude. Those books really resonated for me because, wow, I, I figured this stuff out on my own, but it was really nice to read it so beautifully you know, expressed in his books. Like, very um, affirming for me. Failure was not an option. Absolutely, failure was definitely not an option. Um, oh, I definitely, Darren Moss, I, I definitely believe in hard work uh, and working smarter. Um, you're always learning how to work smarter. And, and frankly, you know what? Leading up to the Red Rally this year, I had that thought many, many times, I mean, literally dozens of times that Man, I'm willing to work hard, but I must not be learning how to work smarter. Because I remember there was one day I worked 19 hours straight, and I'm talking real work for 19 hours. Other than sticking a sandwich in my face and going to pee, I didn't get up from this spot. And I thought to myself, what an idiot I must be. You know, I'm 66 years old. I've been doing this for 29 years, and I haven't figured out how to get more of my staff to do more of my work. But... The stuff they do, I either can't or, or don't do anymore. You know, I used to answer all the phones. I used to send all the emails. I used to open the envelopes. I would, you know, enter stuff in the database at night, all of it. Um, so I'm glad I've got a great staff. We actually do the best staff now that I think we've ever had in the company's history. Um, but there's some things, like I, I couldn't assign the task to the staff of figuring out what the panels would be for the road rally, figuring out who the best people would be. There's a whole, there's a, I can't explain it, but I have a vision for the road rally of, okay, these are the topics. This is the order the topics should be in. These are the people who should be talking about the topics. And then once you lay all that out in paper and go, I'm good, got it all figured out, then everything goes to hell in a handbasket because people can't make a certain time. Um, people will cancel on you 10 days before the road rally. Um, there are all these mitigating circumstances that make you have to bob and weave. And if I assign something like that to staff members, they would just be coming back to me. Well, do you want me to reach out to so-and-so? Can we move this panel here? It's just more expedient to just do it myself, not drive them crazy and not have them driving me crazy by coming back to me with all those questions. It's the kind of th the kind of skills that you can only really acquire by doing. Um, it's not so teachable. It's just the only way to learn it is by doing it. And I've done it now for 24 years. So, I've, you know, I, I know this sounds egotistical. I don't mean it to sound that way. But I can do it better than anybody else only because I've had all that practice. So it just doesn't make sense to involve the staff in those aspects of the road rally, which this year, that was practically the entire road rally. Um, the years that we do it you know, at the West End, the staff ends up doing a ton of work. I mean, just the hours they spend registering people, the registration line, um, they don't have to do that much prior to the rally, um, especially now that we've automated uh, on the website the registration and automated um, the signing up for the mentor lunches. Stuff that we used to do by hand entry um, is now done you know, through the internet. So that has streamlined what the staff has to deal with before the rally, but just going down the list of stuff that we need to bring um, getting all the things together that the sponsors need when they get there, getting the stuff out of the warehouse, making sure every last thing that we need makes it onto the truck, gets unpacked, gets put in the right places once we get to the rally. I mean, there are times where we've got three minutes to solve a problem in whatever device or thing, you know, it could be something as simple as that roll of tape. Where is it? Is it in the ballroom? Is it the registration desk? Is it in the storage room behind the registration desk in one of 27 mail bins? Is it in the 23rd mail bin sitting under two others? But you need this green tape and you gotta have it in three minutes. Those are the kinds of things that go into making a road rally and that's what the staff does so well. Uh, 
question from Mike Esk. Uh, should material used for listings also be uploaded to SoundCloud or YouTube, et cetera, for self-advertising? Um, I personally don't have a problem with that. Um, how many people would see it? You know, if you haven't done the marketing and built the fan base of people that are going to check it out, you're going to have 27 views on YouTube and 14 listens on SoundCloud. So it's really not self-advertising. Plus, um, there are companies that don't want your music out there in the wild before they sign it. There are music supervisors, record labels that for varying reasons don't want music exposed to the public. Um, I'm not sure I can uh, elucidate what all those reasons are, but I know that that's a thing. Um, I know that ad agencies get really weird about that. They want Sometimes they want music that hasn't been released and is not out in the wild. Um, even to the point where if you're doing it as a, you know, as a solo performer on a YouTube page, that's a, a, an issue for them. So if you're not going to get much real advertising value, promotional value from it being there, I wouldn't bother. Then there's the other issue of, okay, so you've got it on YouTube, you've got it on SoundCloud, and now it gets signed by an exclusive library they're going to want you to take it down. And I've seen plenty of people who forget to take it down. They put it up there. Either maybe they're really proud of it and they don't want to take it down. Oh man, it's 441 already. I've got questions to answer on paper here. So I honestly, unless you've got, you know, a couple thousand followers on YouTube um, or SoundCloud, I don't know that you're going to get enough promotional value out of it. Um, It's true, there, there are music libraries and music soups that want it to be released and have a background. Really what they're more interested in than it being released is they're more interested in, is there a story behind the artist? Um, they love that. Some of that is for ego. Some of it is that, you know, I made an early discovery. I knew this band before they blew up. Um, some of it, is, I think maybe a lot of it is for authenticity. They don't want... Uh, you know, studio projects, um, they go through phases of what they like, what they don't like, what turns them on, turns them off. And people are definitely into authenticity. So they want stuff. If you can make music by yourself as a one-man band in a home studio that sounds like a real artist or a real band did it, I don't, no, you know, are they going to pass on something if you don't have a band name um, and some sort of following? If it's the right music, I don't think they would in most cases. Maybe there could be exceptions. But I do know that uh, friends of mine who make music for advertising, definitely, they, they put out albums. They come up with these funny band names. They put out albums with a CD cover. You can't even buy it on a CD. There is no performing band, but they just make it look like they are. And people at the ad agencies are like, oh, I, the Highfields are a great example of that. They don't, to the best of my knowledge, they haven't gigged out in many years. But they do have an entity or two where they have a brand as a band. So I don't know if that was a great answer, but that's what I know. All right, so uh, let me answer these questions. Um, this one's from Glenn Letts. Glenn, are you here today? Um, uh, hey, Michael, great show. I think he was talking about yesterday's show. So you recommended starting out writing instrumental cues by writing cues in the genre in which you are good, even if there isn't a listing for that genre. Um, honestly, yeah, you know what? Uh, I, I don't know what your genre is, Glenn, but let's say that you're good at blues. Um, and we don't have any current blues listings out there. Should you learn how to make instrumental cues in, in a blues form? Yeah. Um, you know, if it's something really obscure, it might not be as helpful, but yeah. If, if you're making something in a genre that will probably come up again, sure, why not? Because you get the double, you know, the two for one deal out of that. Number one, you're getting the experience and the education. And number two, now once you've kind of perfected your stick and you've got a great cue, sooner or later a blues listing is going to pop up. 
Um, now, if it's something really obscure, I'm trying to think of something like we hardly ever, I can't say never, but hardly ever do we get like prog rock listings, you know, something like, yes. Um, so, you know, making cues, prog rock cues, you're going to get the experience, but you probably won't have many libraries that will want what you've got because they don't have many shows that want prog rock. So if their clients don't have a need for a certain genre, then they don't need it as a library and they're not going to come to you to get it. So I hope that answers Glenn's question. Um, Andre Stepanian. By the way, Andre, I saw that somebody else with the last name Stepanian, I want to say, I can't remember. Oh, uh, do you have any relatives named Dominic Stepanian? Because Dominic Stepanian is a recent joiner of Taxi. Um, for all I know, it could be like Smith. Uh, maybe it's a much more common name than I'm aware of, but you're the first Stepanian I've ever known. Um, so Andre says, or asked, one of the best shows, great info and a refresher. Thank you very much. Um, question, in an instrumental track, can there be a solo section as well? And if so, should you tone it down and take into consideration it's going to be used maybe under a dialogue? Yeah, you can have solos. They're not all that common but they're not like forbidden um i think the people that are more experienced in doing instrumental cues um might know how to execute solos that aren't a problem um, maybe a solo in, in in the b section yesterday i talked about you know most cues are mostly if not entirely an a section but oftentimes at least sometimes, if not oftentimes, they do have a B section that, in my personal opinion, is somewhat akin to a bridge. So, yeah, you could have a solo. Now, um, there are certain instruments that are frowned upon. Uh, really, like, high register, very busy um, lead electric lead guitar parts often don't work well in the context, even if the piece is used as background source, ostensibly coming from a jukebox on the other side of the room in a bar that's got a hundred people in it, stinks like beer, smells like smoke, and you've got this rock and roll track playing. If there's a lead, um, even if the music is way down low, which it oftentimes is, the lead is going to be the thing that's going to get your ear and could take you out of the dialogue that's happening. That's what they want to avoid is anything that makes you go, oh, that's great guitar playing. Then they've lost you as far as the dialogue goes. Um, the other one that seems to be the kiss of death is saxophone. Um, they're both in registers that compete with the human voice, depending, you know, is it a six foot four, 250 pound guy with a really low voice or is it a petite 95 pound woman with a little high Minnie Mouse voice. Uh, all those things kind of go into the equation. So you're probably better off leaving the solos out. Then again, you could be doing a swampy blues piece and the B section could be a bottleneck slide in like a mid to low mid register. That's a very simple part. It's not like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> you know, it's more like, wah. again, melody light not Melody Busy. There you go. Steven Seagal movies killed the saxophone. <laughs> There's a song title. <laughs> uh... All right, next one. Um, this one's from Brandon Vaughn. Thanks for the book recommendation. If a listing mentions, oh, this is a good question. If a listing mentions both an instrumental cue, an instrumental or a cue, should a person submit a version of both? This is a two-part question, so I'm going to address that first part. And the answer is, nah, not really. I don't think it's going to pay off. Um, sometimes libraries some libraries traditionally have had a lot of instrumentals, meaning the stuff is like two and a half minutes, maybe as much as four minutes, for whatever reason. Um, I mean, there are some library owners I've met that really didn't understand cue construction when they started out, so they amassed a lot of instrumentals, not cues, and then they went, oh, cues, yes, I need cues. 
So now they're adding cues to their library, but they'll say to us, look, I'll, you know, I'll take instrumentals or instrumental cues. So if a listing says that, it means they will take either or. I don't think that they are by intent looking for both. Yes, I need, you know, a, a blues rock instrumental that's three minutes long and I need blues rock cues. I mean, frankly, uh, most more often than not, they're probably going to end up licensing the cues. There will be times where a blues rock instrumental could be playing, you know, in a bar scene or something where they need a longer piece. But then again, they could also take the cue, which is shorter, typically more like 60 or 90 ish seconds, and they can edit that. Um, especially if they've got stems, then they can really edit it. So I don't think that anybody would expect you to submit both. Um, should someone submit one, one file with a longer instrumental, then a period of silence and then a shorter cue? No, because first of all, the screener's not even, if they, when, once they hear a couple seconds of silence after that first piece, they're not gonna go looking for the cue that follows it, you know, five or 10 or 15 seconds later. Um, so the answer to that would be no. Um, and this one is from Slowfinger221. Um, what if a person has cut the cable? And I don't think he means in a delivery room. I think he means sever, he says, has severed Hollywood. Um, not watching any of those productions for study purposes. Is there a place, a category, where somebody could work on instrumental submissions within your taxi? Um, advertising, perhaps. Should I give up or hook up again and try to stomach all that venal pap that's passing as entertainment these days? Well, how do you really feel about it? This is the only thing holding me back from applying to join your fine organization. Well, thank you for that compliment. I appreciate that. Mind you, I still see and hear enough peripherally to know what's going on. Um, honestly, I don't know that peripherally is enough. You really need to study it. Um, if you feel that what's out there is venal pap, this might not be the right industry or the right part of the industry for you to go into. I, you know, I, I don't want to be the person who encouraged you to listen to or create music that made you want to puke. That, that's no fun for anybody. If it's just not in your DNA to do that, maybe you shouldn't. Um, and... and you know, you don't have to be hooked up to cable. I mean, I'm sure that, um, you know, you may have streaming services like like Hulu or Amazon Prime. Um, I'm sure that you can find episodes of reality TV shows on YouTube that you can watch for free. As a matter of fact, I'm certain of that because I've done some research where I've done it on YouTube. At the very least, you'll find like two to three minute promos for shows that are reality shows. And generally, those shows are edited in a similar, those promos are edited in a similar style and use reality TV instrumental cues pretty much like they would use them on the shows anyway. So that's a good place to learn. And I know for a fact that those exist. So I hope that answers your question. So now I've got seven minutes left. What else can we talk about? San Dimas, the home of raging waters. Uh, weren't Bill and Ted from San Dimas as well? I just had a gurgle. You know what? Must be time. Woo. Must be time for a sip of my new favorite Red Bull flavor, the blue edition, which is blueberry. I do have to remember to bring a couple cases of Rockstar home from the office. Excuse me. Yes, Stephen Giles does live in San Dimas. Wow, you're a real insider if you know that. Question, if somebody is looking for a Def Leppard type material cues for a TV show, 
Should we take out half the drum fills from the track? Wow, you know? It's hard. Honestly, I, I don't want to give you a wild guess on that, Scott. Um, it, it depends on the context, you know? If the way they're going to use those tracks is they're going to have scenes where people walk into a rock club and they need music playing in the background, they would want that stuff to be instrumentals versus instrumental cues because they... You know, they may not show you the band. It's expensive to do, uh, that's called a pre-record, where you've got the music and now you've got a band stand on the stage and imitate like they're playing. It may actually be the band that played it originally, but they're probably not going to record the band on the stage. They're going to have the band submit tracks or go into a studio, record the stuff, and then have the band essentially pantomime it. So if it's, uh, or it's a, a a club that would have Def Leopard type of acts in it, um, they would want stuff that sounds like the records and not like an instrumental cue um, in that setting. So in that case, they would want it to be like records with you know the drum fills, with the guitar parts, the whole ball of wax. That's different than somebody wanting a Def Leopard type of cue in a reality show where somebody buys you know, a 69 Camaro that's all jacked up with a Hurst shifter and thrush mufflers and mag wheels and one of the Kardashian husbands or somebody or brothers or whatever they've got is, got, you know, gets that thing and looks at it in the driveway and then peels out and Def Leppard type music would play. In that case, they would probably want a Def Leppard sounding cue that may or may not work with, a, you know, a guitar and lots of drums doing their thing. Because it could be, and it probably will be, that you'll just hear three to five seconds of the music pumped up loud, and then they're going to do a cutaway to the interior of the car, and the person driving the car is going to turn around and say, so what do you think, man? Well, that's the point where the music gets ducked, and if you got a you know busy drum set um, or shrieking guitars, it's going to combat uh, a conflict with the dialogue. Let me scroll down here. Cowbell drone cues have <laughs> been returned a lot for not having enough cowbells, so I've heard. Ooh, speaking of drones, I just got a new one today. I'm excited. They've gotten really cheap. Um, I just got a... DJI Mavic Mini 2. I had a DJI Spark. I, I've had a lot of drones. I, I can't make myself spend like $1,500 or $3,000 on a drone, but I was way ahead of the curve, man. I've been flying those things for easily 10 years or more. Um, but I loved my DJI Spark. Uh, it took so many updates to the firmware on it that it became kind of a pain in the butt. There would be days where I'd go, I'd wake up on Saturday and go, I've got the day off. I can go fly my drone out in the mountains, which is kind of cool because sometimes you see really interesting stuff out in the hills where you normally wouldn't get to walk. Um, anyway, what did I pay for that thing? I don't know, 350 bucks or something? Um, and it looks to be a great drone. So I am actually donating my DJI Spark to a friend of mine who, when I sent him the email saying, I want you to have this, I know you'll get a lot of joy out of it. He was just over the moon excited. So I picked the right guy to give it to. And uh, now I can't wait to go try my new, uh, I'm charging the battery as we speak. Um, have to wait for daylight tomorrow, but I may be flying the, the drone out of the backyard tomorrow morning. Um, and don't forget, by the way, I see you guys talking about, somebody mentioned uh, giving us a like. Please do, the likes really do help. Uh, I get these emails from people say, I can't believe that Taxi TV um, hasn't taken off and become a lot bigger. But frankly, um, the quarantinis were never intended to be big. You know, we thought it would be 50 people, 100 people, 150 people. We never thought it would be thousands of people. 
and and frankly we've kind of quit marketing it because i really like this group of people um and every now and then we see some new faces and they latch on and go oh that's cool um can we talk about drones for the next 20 minutes uh, that would just be droning on and on scott <laughs> drone cues ahead yeah Bzzz. Anyway, um, aw, I like you too. Thank you, guys. Uh, put a hamster cage behind you. <laughs> Add 100,000 followers. <laughs> really? Or any kind of animal, you know, like a ba maybe I should have a baby duck over there instead of the cab. <laughs> I'd, I'd have like thousands of people. Um, Anyway, so that's it. That is one of my classic shows about nothing at all. I did answer some questions. I answered a lot of questions today. So let's do this again on Thursday, 4 o'clock, right back here. If you're new to this uh, little Manson family we call the Quarantini Happy Hour uh, and you like what you saw today, please hit the red subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, and please give us a thumbs up. And if you guys could uh, go, <laughs> got a stuffed gopher in that taxi model. Um, yeah, there was recently one that was a candidate for being stuffed. I actually sent a picture of it to John Pearson. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll be back Thursday, 4 o'clock. But I, I, could, I don't have any ideas for what to do on that show. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm thinking about for Monday's regular Taxi TV, um, reaching out to Jai Josephs. Probably some of you know him already. He's kind of from that old school uh, song teacher category. The guys, you know, the top five Jason Bloom type people. And I remember years ago watching Jai do a thing on Melody that I thought was stupendously good. I don't know if he still does that kind of thing. Um, but I'm going to see if Jai is available. I know he wanted to be part of the road rally and I wrote a post-it note and I stuck it in my little, it's over there somewhere, stuck it in my little day runner. And a couple days ago, I was going back to look for a phone number and I saw the post-it note, Jai Joseph's road rally. And I totally forgot. I also forgot, um, Henry Winkle, who used to kind of be a regular in these things. Um, and, and I totally forgot both those guys. Like, put it on a post-it note, stuck it on the calendar, and then flip the page to the next week, and that was the end of that. So I feel bad. So wonder, how about Dean Crepain again? I've had that thought recently. Um, I saw somebody else make a suggestion. Anyway, yeah, if you guys could stop by and drop a comment or two about ideas for Thursday's Quarantini Happy Hour, that would be awesome. Um, and that's it. So, adios. Let's listen to a little Keith LeBrant on the way out. Bye, you guys. Oops. <laughs> I hit the wrong damn button. Good thing I'm not flying a plane. <laughs>